Yes, Mr. Chesterton, I am a rationalist and I do not believe in miracles. The rationalist denies all miracles alike. He does not waste his time questioning them. He does not pretend to be agnostic about them. He does not suspend his judgment until they shall be proved. He denies them for the plain, simple reason that miracles are impossible. Miracles do not occur. The universe is governed by laws. Mr. Bashford, we cannot call a thing impossible because the world is governed by laws unless we know what laws. Do you know all about the laws in the universe? And if you do not know, how can you possibly know anything about the exceptions? For obviously, the mere fact that a thing happens seldom and under odd circumstances and with no explanation within our knowledge is no proof that it is against natural law. That would apply to the Siamese twins, or, or to a new comet, perhaps, or, or to a politician uh, telling the truth. <laughs> Many of your so-called miracles have been exposed as fraudulent. They are simply tricks and are easily reproduced by conjurers and magicians and swindling mediums. <sighs> that is not an argument at all, sir. Good or bad. A false ghost disproves the reality of ghosts exactly as a forged banknote disproves the reality of the Bank of England. <laughs> if anything, it proves its existence. Yes, but there remains the philosophical case against miracles. The philosophical case against miracles is easily dealt with. There is no philosophical case against miracles. <laughs> there are such things as the laws of nature, rationally speaking, but everybody knows is this only. We know that there is repetition in nature. We know that pumpkins produce pumpkins. What nobody knows is why they should not produce elephants and giraffes. <laughs> the question of miracles is merely this. Do you know why a pumpkin goes on being a pumpkin? You can't be serious. Of course I'm serious. If you do not know why a pumpkin goes on being a pumpkin, you cannot possibly tell whether a pumpkin could turn into a coach or, or, or could not. <laughs> it is a law of nature that pumpkins should go on being pumpkins. That only means that pumpkins generally do remain pumpkins, which is obvious and does not say why. Experience is against it. That means so long as pumpkins are pumpkins, their conduct is pumpkiny <laughs> and bears no resemblance to the conduct of a coach. That is fairly obvious. What Christianity says is merely this, that this repetition in nature has its origin not in a thing resembling a law, but in a thing resembling a will, that the world and its repetition came by will. It believes that a god who could do anything too extraordinary as making pumpkins go on being pumpkins is capable of anything. If you do not think it extraordinary that a pumpkin is always a pumpkin, you have not even begun philosophy. <laughs> Historical evidence is against it. <laughs> the historical case against miracles is also rather simple. It consists of calling miracles impossible, then saying that no one but a fool believes in possibilities, then declaring that there is no wise evidence on behalf of the miraculous. The whole trick is done by means of leaning alternately on the philosophical and historical objection. If we say miracles are theoretically possible, you say, yes, but there is no evidence for them. When we take all of the records of the human race and say, here is your evidence, you say that these people were superstitious. They believed in impossible things. <laughs> the fact is that believers in miracles accept them only in connection with some dogma. The disbelievers in miracles examine the evidence fairly and find it unconvincing. <laughs> the fact, Mr. Blatchford, is quite the other way. The believers in miracles accept them, rightly or wrongly, because they have evidence for them. The disbelievers in miracles deny them, rightly or wrongly, because they have a doctrine against them. The open, obvious, democratic thing is to believe an old apple woman when she bears testimony to a miracle. 
Just as you believe an old apple woman when she, when she bears testimony uh, to a murder. <laughs> murder, Mr. Chesterton. However, unusual and unpleasant is still more natural than its miraculous antithesis, resurrection. A miracle is an incident, true or false, like a murder. And all that we want in a witness to an incident is that the witness should be honest and in possession of his five senses. One does not need any learning to say that a man was killed or that a man was raised from the dead. One does not need to be an astronomer to say that a star fell from heaven, or a botanist to say that a fig tree is withered, or a chemist to say that one had seen water turn to wine, or a surgeon to say that one has seen wounds in the hands of St. Francis. On such points, an ordinary man is either a liar or he is a madman. Or oh, perhaps he is telling the truth. There is no possibility of being an expert witness. And it is undemocratic to refuse popular evidence on such points. It is like refusing to believe that anyone but a judge in wig and gown could really have been a witness to a burglary. <laughs> Even so, I rather doubt that any of your evidence for miracles would stand up in a court of law. I think it would be very difficult to convince a modern judge in an English court of the truth of the resurrection. <laughs> Not difficult, Mr. Blatchford. Impossible. But it does not seem to occur to you that we Christians have not <coughs> such an extravagant reverence for English judges as you do. <laughs> the experiences of the founder of Christianity have perhaps left us in a vague doubt of the infallibility of courts of law. <laughs> then, if you will not accept the impartial judgment of the courts, consider them the partial judgment of other religions. The fact is, the Christian denies the miracles of the Muslim, and the Muslim denies the miracles of the Christian. <laughs> Mr. Blatchford, you are quite wrong in supposing that the Christian and the Muslim deny each other's miracles. No religion that thinks itself true bothers about the miracles of another religion. It denies the doctrines of that religion, it denies its morals, but it never thinks it's worthwhile to deny its signs and wonders. And why not? Because these things have always been thought possible. Because the general existence of a world of spirits and of strange mental powers is a part of the common sense of all mankind. The Pharisees did not dispute the miracles of Christ. They said that they were worked by devilry. The Roman world did not deny the possibility that Christ was a god. It was far too enlightened for that. What matters about a religion is not whether it can work marvels like any ragged Indian conjurer, but whether it has a true philosophy of the universe. The Romans, as I say, were quite willing to admit that Christ was a god. What they denied was that he was the god, the highest truth of the cosmos. And this is the only point worth discussing about Christianity. <laughs> Mr. Chesterton, despite your facile answers and your utter credulity over miracles, I am quite certain that you could not perform a miracle. <laughs> well, you've done it. You have revealed to the public the little known and carefully concealed fact that I cannot work miracles. <laughs> it has been discovered that I cannot move Westminster Abbey from London to Paris, nor can I levitate, which in my case would probably even be more miraculous. <laughs> However, it affects the question of whether miracles can happen about as much as the fact that I cannot tame lions affects the question of whether they have ever been tamed. A miracle is, by hypothesis, a marvel. That is to say, it is a very rare and very unexpected thing. If it could be done by anybody at any moment, it no longer meets the definition of being a miracle. I cannot work miracles, but I think it probable that there are some people who can. And I seem to remember somebody who, I believe, could work miracles, but who was taunted in the hour of death with not working them and taunted in vain. <laughs>